Welcome to the regular meeting of the Climate and Infrastructure Committee for March 28th, 2024. I'm Katie Cashman. I'm the chair of this committee. At this time, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll we can, so we can verify a quorum for this meeting. Councilmember Vitoff. Present. Osmuth. Present. Chavez. Present. Chowdhury. Present. Vice Chair Kosky. Present. Chair Cashman. Present. There are six members present. Thank you. Let the record reflect we have a quorum. We will start with our consent agenda. There are seven items on the consent agenda today, which I will read for the record. Number two, um, Franklin Avenue reconstruction project approval and easements. Three, setting a public hearing for Hennepin Avenue and First Avenue Northeast multimodal improvements. Four, Richfield Road sidewalk and trail project design, construction, maintenance, and ownership. Five, setting a, hear a public hearing for the stormwater management program and annual report. Six, litter capture boom system at Lake of the Isles. Seven, parking rates for large-scale events at U.S. Bank Stadium, Target Center, and Target Field. Eight, setting a public hearing to consider the mayor's nomination of Timothy Sexton as the public works director. Looking forward to that hearing. Um, I would like to pull item six for just a brief presentation from uh, Interim Director Brett Jelly. And is there any other items that anyone would like to discuss on the consent agenda? Yes, uh, I'd like to pull item two for discussion. Okay. Um, so with that, I'll move uh, the consent agenda for approval, except items two and six. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. <coughs> Any abstentions? Okay, great. Uh, the, um, those consent agenda items are approved. And... Interim Director Brett Jelly, would you mind uh, sharing a little bit about number six, the litter capture boom system at Lake of the Isles? Thank you, Chair Cashman. Brett Jelly, Interim Director of Public Works. I'd like to ask Elizabeth Stout with our Surface Water and Sewers Group to come up and give a brief overview of that. Thank item. you so much. Thank you, Chair Cashman and committee members. I'm Elizabeth Stout. I am a principal professional engineer with the Surface Water and Sewers Division of Public Works. Um, uh, just some brief information on this litter capture boom. Um, this is a system that is going to be installed within the Lake of the Isles, within the lake itself. It is a kind of two boom system that will be used to capture trash that then comes into the lake before it can then you know, get into the lake itself. This is very similar to a boom system that was installed last year at Lake Hiawatha. Um, we've been fortunate enough to receive a donation from River Network and Freshwater Society to allow us to put this boom system in. Um, we chose this location at Lake of the Isles because we have found that trash generation is most likely corresponding with commercial areas and transit corridors. Um, a very a significant section of Hennepin Avenue drains to this particular pipe, and this section of Hennepin is actually going to be reconstructed. It gives us a very unique opportunity to look at what trash gets into the lake and is collected before the road reconstruction, and then as we put in stormwater best management practices throughout the corridor that will actually both promote water quality as well as collecting trash, we'll be able to see the success of those or what success level we get. Um, we're planning on having this boom in at least three years as kind of a pilot to see the success that we're having with, with removing trash through this area. Um, we're also tying this effort to some community engagement. We've been working with the uh, Friends of Lake of the Isles quite closely on choosing this location and the type of system we're putting in here. And we're also tying it to education efforts, um, like the Adopted Drain Program and other just um, educating businesses as we're type kind of classifying the type of litter and trash we're collecting. Thank you so much, I missed out. I just couldn't be more excited about this. Uh, I know that the Euclid um, stormwater drainage output into Lake of the Isles is, is extremely dirty and that's where a lot of people put in their canoes. So it's just really exciting to have this opportunity and thanks so much for leading on it. 
Um, just out of curiosity, how much does the boom cost? Um, the boom itself, as well, or excuse me, um, Chair Cashman and committee members, the boom itself, as well as the installation and removal, um, not interim maintenance, costs about $45,000. And then we will also be contracting the maintenance for this boom, which they'll be going every two weeks, as well as the one at Lake Hiawatha as well. Okay, thank you so much. Um, do any colleagues have questions on this item? Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll move approval of this item. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Any abstentions? That item is approved, thank you. And uh, Councilmember Osmond, did you wanna speak on was it number two? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I wanna pull up this item for and ask the staff to kinda go over what this item is about. Uh, I did get a briefing from the staff. This is a excitement project for Franklin um, from Chicago all the way to Lindale, I believe. A project that's happening and um, what we, what I got from the staff is that this is uh, prioritizing more for all users, uh, safety and comfort of the street. Um, so I would like to get more information if there's a staff here who can give us uh, just the overview of the project and how this will, um, you know, good priority for the safety and um, the walkability and the users for all uh, for Franklin Avenue uh, through Chicago and this project that's coming up through Hennepin County, I believe. Okay, thank you, um, Councilmember Osman. This this Franklin Avenue reconstruction also comes into Ward, Ward 7, um, and I also had a briefing with staff and was really excited about their project, and it seems like there's a lot of community um, consistency among the, the engagement that you did, and so, yes, thank you for being here and for answering some questions for us, if you don't mind. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, Chair Cashman and members of the committee, Council Member Osman. Uh, thank you for asking us. Uh, my name is Peter Bennett. I'm a transportation planner with Public Works. And I have been a liaison to the Hennepin County team who have been working on the Franklin Avenue reconstruction project, uh, developing a concept layout. Uh, so today, Franklin Avenue is a street that is four lanes today, two lanes in each direction and undivided. So that's a street where uh, oftentimes someone might stop in the leftmost lane to make a left turn, and the right side lane uh, sometimes has a car parked in it, sometimes not at different times of day. Um, so that type of street design has a lot of um, safety concerns with um, turning vehicles, just ability to make a turn, and that has hampered the pedestrian and bicycle travel along the street. So you're making a turn and you would uh, the visibility of the, those users has been very compromised. And so a reconstruction project is a wonderful opportunity to be able to include uh, wider sidewalks, bike lanes, uh, landscaped boulevards, those kind of elements. Um, when you're digging up the roadway all the way from property line to property line, uh, it's a great opportunity to really re-envision what the street could look like. Uh, the process started several years ago with some engagement about just generally what should the vision of the street look like, and uh, then started narrowing down from the universe of possibilities to a few uh, cross sections that would uh, fit within the space that we were working with. And those were what were presented at a series of community meetings, also going to specific neighborhood associations and presenting to them uh, and getting to a concept layout, which is what we have presented with you today. And uh, that layout has been attached to the request for council action and uh, other elements of that engagement process are written into the request for council action. Uh, thank I'm you so much. happy to take any questions. Thank, thank you so much. I uh, represent in Ward 6 uh, through BV Park. There's a lot of uh, pedestrian, a lot of people that walk and use that. I understand this, uh, project will separate the bike lane and pedestrian lane. Also, there's a green space. Um, where would the green space be? Is it between the pedestrian and the bike lane? If you can uh, yeah, so Chair Cashman, members of the committee, uh, the green boulevard, uh, which could have uh, trees or grass or green stormwater infrastructure in it, any of that area 
is always on the street side of the bike lane. Mm -hmm. So if you work from the building face inward, first you start with a sidewalk and then a bike lane and then the green space. Uh, and that green space would also host uh, like lighting and utility poles <coughs> and signage. And then the first, then there's a curb before the roadway after that. Thank you so much. I'm excited for this project and look forward to um, supporting it. And I think that it's, it's about time for Franklin to get um, uh, on this project to, to get going. Uh, like I say, there's, it's a busy street. Um, safety is number one for the community that uses in that area. And for anyone who would like to bike or walk in, in a safe area on Franklin. So super excited for this project. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to echo that having bike lanes and, and better sidewalk infrastructure on this street is going to be so crucial for uh, safety on this corridor. As someone who walks my dog to the co-op on Franklin and Lindale very frequently and um, just trying to get across the street can be very dangerous because there aren't many opportunities to cross. So I know that you also added a a crosswalk with a sort of median in the middle too. So like more opportunities for people to get across Franklin safely without having to dodge traffic. Um, so thank you so much for adding some detail here today. Thank you, Chair Cashman. And Anybody else want to comment or question on Franklin Ave? Okay, with that I'll move approval of this item. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Any abstentions? That item carries, thank you. Next is a public hearing for the 11th Avenue South resurfacing project. I'll ask Director Brett Jelly to introduce this item. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Larry Matsumoto, Principal Professional Engineer in Transportation, Maintenance, and Repair, will introduce this item. Good afternoon, committee chair, members of the Climate and Infrastructure Committee. My name is Lawrence Matsumoto. I am, I am a principal professional engineer in public works, and I am here to present to you the public hearing on 11th Avenue South resurfacing project. 11th Avenue South is a Minnesota state aid street bounded by West River Parkway to 8th Street South, and it was reconstructed in 2001 and in 1976 and has a pavement condition index of 67 and 37. The scope of the project is a mill and overlay uh, with which is known as street resurfacing. On February 8th of 2024, the City Council designated the improvements proposed to the 2024 street resurfacing program. The purpose of the asphalt Pavement resurfacing program is to extend the life of city streets which are not scheduled for any preventative maintenance, renovation, or reconstruction in the foreseeable future. This resurfacing program is addressing city streets that are at the point in their life cycle where a new surface will extend the street's life and improve ride quality and neighborhood livability, and also to help slow the overall deterioration of our city street system. Public Works hosted a community meeting on Tuesday, March 26th at 2 p.m. with 1,463 invitations mailed and four attendees came to this meeting. Due to the gap in the availability of information for some of the properties in the influence area of this project, an error was made in the special assessment notification process including but not limited to the assessment amounts for the condominium building located at 1111 West River Parkway. Therefore, Public Works recommends that the public hearing remain open at this meeting and be continued until May 2nd of 2024 at the Climate and Infrastructure Committee meeting. This concludes my presentation and I am available for any questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Mr. Matsumoto. Do any of my colleagues have questions on this item? Okay, thank you. So with that, I will proceed to open the public hearing. And if you did not, did not sign up yet and wish to speak, please see the clerk to sign up. Each speaker will have two minutes to provide testimony. I see that some folks who signed up were able to speak with staff and have their questions resolved, but we do have one more person signed up to speak. So I'll invite Stephen Tayaki from Ward 3.
Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Cashman, members of the committee. My name is Stephen Tayek. I live with my partner, Robin Mueller, at one of the units in the 11 condominium building. We did receive an assessment. We were basically shocked at the amount of the assessment. And uh, we did meet yesterday with Mr. Masamoto at the public uh, information meeting and really appreciated the feedback. We did file a formal objection to our assessment uh, through the process. I just wanted to point out one thing for the record so far as the public hearing will affect our assessments going forward, that on the map uh, for the project, the area that is shown within the area of influence related to our building is the access drive into the property. That is actually a shared driveway because there is a public parking uh, uh, component of our building that's owned separately from the condominium. So I feel that that should be apportioned properly between the owner of that public property for, par for parking purposes and the condominium to the extent that it would affect the condominium homeowners at the 11 condominium building. And I'll just reserve any further comments to see from this point on how the assessments are, are recalibrated and re-noticed to the residents in our building. Thank you. Thank you so much and appreciate our staff for working you know, with each folks and their concerns around assessments. Um, is there anybody else who would like to speak on this item? So as Mr. Matsumoto and Director Jelly explained, we will not complete the hearing today. And those who would like to speak on this item will have the opportunity to come back and speak on May 2nd at 1.30. Uh, so I will move to continue this hearing to the meeting scheduled for May 2nd at 1.30. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Okay, that, and any abstentions? Thank you, that item carries. Councilmember Chavez. Thank you, Chair Cashman. I did have a question for staff, if they can walk us through the public and private uh, question that was mentioned um, from someone that just testified. I would just like to know more information about that. Chair Cashman and Councilmember Chavez, um, I, uh, I won't have a specific answer in this case. I do know, so when we're, we're we have the influence area uh, for assessments. We're looking at who owns the land. Um, I'm not, I guess what we'll need to look into is if it's being used by multiple people, whether or not um, that is a factor. It also might be something that would be worked out between the owner of the land and the users of that driveway. Thank you. I'm just trying to figure out if the city uses that as public parking for anything or, okay. Thank you. I'll speak into the mic, uh, Chair Cashman, Council Member Chavez. I don't believe there's any city-owned public parking there. It might be, um, it could be just parking that's available to other uses. Okay, thank you. I would just recommend the person that testified to connect with our city staff and figure out if you can get an update on that when this comes back in May. Thank you, Council Member. Okay, so next we have item number nine, which is a public comment period related to the Climate Legacy Initiative implementation. And before I open up the public comment period, I'll invite Patrick Hanlon from the Health Department to give us a brief presentation. Thank you for your patience. Uh, Chair Cashman, council members, uh, just gonna give a brief update of, we, we had a longer Q1 update uh, a couple weeks ago on the Climate Legacy Initiative for quarter one. My name is Patrick Hamlin. I'm the Deputy Commissioner of Sustainability Healthy Homes and that didn't mean to be a cliffhanger and <laughs> environment. Uh, we'll get that fixed. Uh, so the Climate Equity Plan uh, was passed. It's a really ambitious science-based uh, plan that centers, centers equity uh, it, for the city in hitting its greenhouse gas uh, reduction targets. And uh, a, a lot of kudos goes out to Kim Havey, uh, the Director of Sustainability here for, with the uh, policy and outreach work and working with a really impressive uh, outreach with uh, community and really intentional conversations with uh, our cultural communities and in informing that plan. And the Climate Legacy Initiative is the first step of implementing that climate equity plan. 
it's uh, broken down into eight uh, major categories. One is green jobs and training. Is in order to get all of this work done, in order to hit all of these ambitious targets, we need more people in these fields. Um, and so there's uh, CPED is, is leading a lot of that work, and we have some of our uh, health department staff that work on green careers and exposure as well. There is that is the uh, the initial phase of all of the work is really getting out there and getting people trained in these fields with. Uh, partners who know how to do that work. Number two is uh, renewable and energy efficient homes. And there's a lot of comments that are coming up on electrification. We are part of an Electrify Everything uh, uh, coalition with a number of cities. And so that is part of that strategy. When we say energy efficient homes, it is looking at electrification strategies first uh, when we go in and where possible to do electrification of homes and businesses, looking across all sectors. So the residential, multifamily, uh, industrial, commercial, large, uh, large multifamily projects uh, and low income buildings, every sector, we have strategies that we're laying out and having incentive based programs to, to help people in the community overcome the financial challenges that they have. Number three is community outreach and engagement, is making sure that people are aware of all of these different programs. Uh, and there is a, uh, we just finalized some uh, marketing contracts. Uh, Kim, again, Kim Havey and his team are out there working with neighborhood organizations and getting out into the community. Number four is planting trees, pretty simple one, but we are gonna be just planting a lot more trees and we have an $8 million contract with, or $8 million grant with the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, just to replace trees that are coming down through the Emerald Ash Borer, but then also getting out and planting as many trees as we can. We'll be planting twice as many trees uh, as we have in previous years every year. Uh, number five is capturing carbon. We have a biochar program that uh, sequesters carbon and that equipment is uh, in route here and we are working with Public Works, with CPED, uh, with folks in developing that site and we should be producing biochar and having a carbon sequestration strategy, one of only three cities in the U.S. to, be, uh, to have that program uh, that should be up this fall. Number six is local food waste reduction is doing grants out with uh, folks that are doing uh, local food waste and looking at food deserts and having grants and resources for community organizations and getting that work. Number seven is electrical vehicle, electric vehicle charging stations. Public Works is leading that charge, no pun intended. Um, and, uh, they're, and they're doing amazing work and we'll also be looking at what can we do on the, pri on the private side to have incentive based programs there. And then of course to get all this work done, administration and policy. And then uh, as the plan mentions, we just always want to mention this, we center equity in all of this work. And so at least 40% of the funding, uh, according to the White House Justice 40 standards, goes out to disadvantaged communities. And these are a list of areas that we use to qualify our environmental justice uh, investments out in the community. And currently with our programs, we are at about a 60% investment in environmental justice. And so to make sure that we maintain at least that 40% and, and hit that 60% as much as possible. These are, uh, we kind of broke down the, in that last meeting, all of the different tactics. We have 43 different tactics that are in motion uh, right now. I don't know if I ever would have dreamt in my career that we'd have this kind of investment in, uh, in climate in one year. So this is really impressive. And it's a lot of programs that get up and off the ground in one year. And everyone is working, uh, firing on all cylinders or all maybe all electric uh, volts wattage uh, at one time, trying to get all of these programs out into the community. Uh, and so we, we are off and running. And as you can see, most of the programs are either launched or in progress uh, and with most of the other programs being scheduled to, to get out the door uh, by mid-year. And all of these, when we talk about administration, all of, these di all of this different work, we do a lot of tracking of individual programs, but really making sure that we're driving towards those science-based goals up at the top. And so we're gonna have, there's a lot of work going on across the city and all of our departments, there are a lot of experts in uh, sustainability. And so how do we start looking at all of the work that we're doing in all of our different departments and really drive towards those science-based targets? Scaling to uh, the challenge, so as we meet, go to get those, uh, hit those, those ambitious targets up at the top there is that we are scaling up our programs and and for right now just a reminder to folks that we are just coming up on four months into uh, having this money uh, in the city and so that takes time to get all of these programs set up even working with our community partners you see there's a lot of feedback in in the public uh, comments that came in on um, doing block by block approaches and we have contracts with people that are that are looking at doing that block by block approach and the barrier really isn't money right now. The barrier really is the time for these people to set up the programs. And in fact, the people that had come to us and said they were gonna be doing a thousand homes a year, 
uh, with these programs, you know, we've gone back and then it went down to 400 homes and then it's gone down to, hey, we, we just want to get 10 homes or 20 homes done on a block by block approach by the end of the year. And that's coming from the, the community organizations that we're working with. So we're in contract with a lot of different folks and, um, and anyone that's out there, any one of those partners that can come up with plans, we start out with approach that is we put money into success. So when people can put a program on the ground and get success that we start a contract and that we can scale that program uh, to, the, to the scale of the problem. So this is really kind of the timeline that we're looking at is starting out with setting up these programs, building the machine this year, going into next year and, and starting to scale and then looking at 2026 and how, we're, how do we really start to scale to the, uh, to the scope of the problem. Um, and so that's where, that's uh, the Q1 summary, uh, a, a brief uh, summary of where we're at. And I can stand by for questions uh, as you open up for a public comment. Thank you so much, um, Deputy Director Hanlon. Um, are there any comments from colleagues on this? Or I think it would be great for us to just open the public hearing too. And then, you know, if folks do have questions for you, I think you'll be in the audience as well. So Sure. And I have read through all the public comments. And so if you at any point, if you'd like me to comment on some of those, I can. OK, wonderful. Thank you. So I will now open the public comment period. Um, we have received dozens of written comments on the Climate Legacy Initiative since our last meeting. And I'm excited to invite further comments today uh, from the community and coalition members and residents of our city who are here. Thank you so much for coming to speak. So if you would like to make a comment, you haven't signed up already, please sh make sure to sign up with the clerk. But with that, I will invite our first speaker, Ron Eldred from Ward 10. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ron Eldred. I live in Uptown in, in Ward 10. I am a member of UNIDOS, and Pat, my wife, is a dedicated member of Isaiah. I joined UNITAS just as the Minneapolis Climate Equity Plan and Companion $10 million was approved last year. So along with my wife, two married children, and four grandchildren, we offer a huge thank you for that effort. All 10 of us live in Minneapolis. We understand keenly the dangerous climate problems we have and we are immensely pleased with last year's efforts. So way to go, really. <laughs> but to a person, each of us remains worried and anxious about the future. We know that even with federal rebates, state help, county help, it will take at the current rate decades to decarbonize our homes, provide cheap, clean energy, and see the end of fossil fuel usage. So our offspring are worried about their futures in the coming decades of their lives, and my wife and I are heart sick that we are leaving them with huge unsolved climate issues. It remains unsaid that the pace of the climate equity program work and the funding that supports it needs to be greatly accelerated. Secondly, that the scope of it needs to be widened to include geothermal technology, and that the initial efforts to include workers from the green zones must be ramped up. Finally, the welcome reporting of progress like was presented in the last committee meeting and just a, a, a moment ago, needs to be maintained and offered to a broader audience of Minneapolis citizens. In closing, thank you for welcoming Minneapolis citizens the opportunity to tell you about our opinions, our desires, and our dreams. Thank you so much, Ron. Our next speaker is Lisa Rudolph from Ward 6. Good afternoon, Chairman Cashman and members of the committee. I would like to reiterate Ron's thank you very much for the steps of the Climate Legacy Initiative and all of the equity and energy work that's being done. We all know that the $10 million will provide clean money for maybe you know, 500 to 1,000 homes. 
Minneapolis needs like 5,000 to 10,000 homes to be improved. To meet this need, we need to increase the funding every year, ramp up the franchise fee spending over the next six years to increase from $10 million to the estimated $118 million a year that will be required for the full plan to be funded. If we go house by house, this will never happen. We need block by block or a city coordinated program to scale up electrification, weatherization, green union jobs in order to meet all of the need for clean energy homes that Minneapolis will face. My mother is 94. She lives in an apartment in a senior living complex in the South Side Green Zone. Without block by block or some city program, she will never receive the benefits of gas-free cooking, good weatherization, and clean energy heat. Everyone deserves the benefits of clean energy homes. Minneapolis right now has the chance to lead our country in green jobs and green homes. Only your decisive action to increase funding and coordinate a real citywide campaign will make that possible. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Our next speaker is Marie from Ward 11. Good afternoon, Chair Cashman, Vice Chair Kosky, and members of the committee. My name is Marie Franchette, Ward 11. I'm a member of Unidos. And I also wanted to thank you for approving $10 million to start the implementation of the Climate and Equity Plan this year. Um, it's really exciting to see um, Minneapolis moving ahead on this, and I think Minneapolis is going to be a model for some of the other cities in this country, so it's really exciting to see that. But at the same time this winter, when I looked out the window and saw the brown and dry landscape, I really felt terrible about what it means for the future of Minnesota and our ecology here, and I'm worried about my kids and their kids to have a safe and healthy living environment and how these severe weather events are going to be affecting vulnerable communities in Minneapolis and all over the world. Um, you know, the N United Nations um, just released this month their global climate um, report, which says that there's been, that 2023, you know, has been the worst year on record for temperature increases, climate change, and with record breaking decreases in, you know, um, glaciers and Arctic ice and the, with warming of the ocean. They're saying it's more like a red alert event and that we really have to be, make take drastic action to reduce carbon emissions, which the Minneapolis Climate and Equity Plan is has really great goals for reducing emissions, but as some other folks have said, it's the funding at 10 million for this year is really great, but it's not gonna be enough to address more than about one-tenth of the homes that we need to be retrofitting per year. And so I would also request that you consider increasing the amount of funding for this plan to $20 million next year and then ramping up to 10, 100 to $118 million over six years. And thanks again for your great leadership on, on the Climate and Equity Plan. Okay. Thank you, Marie. Our next speaker is Ula Nilsson from Ward 8. Good afternoon, um, thanks for having us here. And I just wanna again thank uh, the city council and city sustainability staff for all of the really hard work getting the climate legacy initiative and climate equity plan going. It's really exciting to see all of the things that are happening and how fast that's going. Um, so just really appreciative of the hard work and um, I, yeah, similarly to other folks, I, I, looking at the graph, it looks like, you know, increased investment is planned. Um, and I would urge us to think about how fast we need to go. Um, I was listening to my favorite podcast the other day, uh, interview with the um, chief advisor for the clean energy transition of the White House Science and Technology Department. And he was saying that at this point, we need to be moving as fast as possible with everything that we know how to do, and at the same time, like measuring success and, and improving the things that we're doing. Like we have to do both. We can't just be studying things and waiting and like, you know, uh, yeah, we have to be implementing as fast as humanly possible 
and improving our implementation as we go and learning from what we're doing. Um, and I, you know, uh, there are lots of other parts of the country that are doing this effectively uh, that we can look at, that we can learn from. So I urge us to be moving with all possible haste in order to meet the demands that our climate is putting before us and to make all of these benefits available to all members of our community. So thank you. Thanks, Ula. Thanks for your leadership. Our next speaker is Kent Fritz from Ward 2. Hi, uh, council members. Thanks for having us here today. Uh, it's Kent Fritz Smead, hyphenated last name, but a lot of people stumble on that. So Ward 2, um, I'm here as a member of UNIDOS, and like the other speakers, I'd like to really thank the council members for their vote last year to uh, develop or begin the Climate Legacy Initiative. And I, use, I emphasize the word begin because we have a long, long road ahead of us to mitigate the problems of climate change. Um, so I would encourage, urge the uh, <laughs> council to increase, ramp up the resources that are available for this work. Um, staff person Harlan's comments are, are well taken. Laying the groundwork, the planning for this is, I can imagine, an incredible task. And to engage communities requires a lot of outreach into um, those communities, particularly where communities are um, struggling with kind of day-to-day -day issues of life, um, taking care of children, taking care of elder members of their family, paying their bills. Um, we're all crawling, still crawling out of the rock of COVID uh, to various degrees. So at any rate, there, there's some urgency to this matter. And um, so in addition to the resources that I think we need to have, uh, we need to make sure that we're creating pathways for some of that work uh, from people who have not traditionally been hired into the trades over the years. And um, there are a number of training opportunities that are coming into being within Minneapolis and we need to make use of those. Um, the city has out laid out a, a, a goal of 85% reduction of fossil fuels by uh, 2035. So. Let's continue to use that as our benchmark and reach it sooner if we can. Thank you. Thank you, Kent. Our next speaker is Kate Pavlin from Ward 3. Hi, thank you very much, Chair Cashman. I'm Kate Havlin, Ward 3, and I want to add my voice thanking you all for the progress that you've made, thanking the city. We've been hearing about climate so much. I think Minnesotans are very comfortable talking about climate. I think many Minnesotans, especially white Minnesotans, are not as comfortable talking about equity. This is a climate equity plan, and block by block is a climate equity solution. It will help us in terms of climate. It will move us forward if we can do a block by block pilot program in different parts of the city, especially green zones that target areas that have disproportionately not had access to good housing. If we can also give uh, people in those areas a chance to have access to the good union jobs. We don't have enough electricians in our city. We don't have enough green energy workers. And if we can give people access to union jobs, I had a union job, I know that was my best salary ever. We need more people to have more access people who have not had access to good union jobs. I also think of the people who live in those green um, zones right now where disproportionately black and indigenous children have so much higher rates of asthma. My son, one of my sons ended up having asthma. I remember a couple scary trips to the emergency room. We could afford the nebulizer. We could afford the prednisone. And I think that there's a lot of kids and families who cannot and the idea that in Minneapolis we have families whose kids cannot breathe because of what's called the natural grass in our stoves and in our heating systems because they live near freeways that disproportionately have had a lot more um, air pollution. But the leading cause of pollution, greenhouse gas pollution in our cities now is the places we live. We can do better and block by block pilot will help us. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Kate. Our next speaker is Meg Kozowski from Word One. Thank you, Chair Cashman and City Council members for the chance to speak today. Um, I'm here to speak up for everybody who lives in our shared fishbowl. Our atmosphere is not subject to lines on a map or dollar values on a balance sheet. Pollution doesn't care whether a person lives in a city or the countryside. The air doesn't stop blowing whether a person lives in a home or an apartment that they rent. We've been told for years that the ethical and physical harms of our systems are fine because they're externalized. And we're now suffering the consequences of that view. There are no externalities. Everything here on Earth is connected. In his book, Five Times Faster, Rethinking the Science, Economics, and Diplomacy of Climate Change, Simon Sharp points out that to survive, we need to radically change how we act on the climate crisis. Our institutional policies are often what are dooming us. Federal clean energy programs provide money to homeowners, but half of Minneapolis residents are renters and don't qualify for those. That is not okay, and it is not going to solve the problem. We can't succeed if we omit half the people from the process. This affects everyone regardless of race, age, rental status, geography, or any other metric. We will all make it together or we will all perish together. We need to include everyone. And for this reason, I'm asking that you expand the existing Climate Legacy Initiative. Thank you so much for your work on that. Um, to include more than 100 million in funding and to build programs and policies that specifically protect renters. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. Next speaker is Lee Samuelson from Ward 12. Chair Cashman and members of the committee, I'm speaking on behalf of Community Power, which has helped craft some detailed guidance on implementing the Climate Legacy Initiative funds that I will submit to the clerk as a comment inspired by the Portland Clean Energy Fund. We're looking forward to collaborating with Cooperative Energy Futures on the pilot project, which Patrick Hanlon referred to on page 8 of his March 14th slideshow. This $10 million is a good first step in a massive transition that we have to make as a city, but it only supports 500 to 1,000 home upgrades per year, and we need 10 times that amount to meet the city climate goals here. So let's start building up that capacity and ramp up that activity and double down on those investments over time. Regarding the boom and bust cycles of new state, federal, or utility incentives, the problem for the city to solve is that these come primarily in the form of widely regressive, complex, or hard to navigate forms of individual tax credits, rebates, or income qualified programs. So we need to create energy improvement programs that are not dependent upon people having upfront cash or being able to take out a bank loan. As a result, it is essential that this be a dedicated fund scaled up to 100 million per year in the next three to four years using the social cost of carbon with transparency to the community government's body that Kim Havey is planning. And lastly, we urge the city to reserve a portion of the $10 million to explore network geothermal districts. I'm getting pumped up to see this groundbreaking energy source gathering steam and for the jobs and all sectors of it to be union. Thank you. Well said, Lee. <laughs> Our next speaker is Dan Turner from Ward 2. Hello, Council. Uh, nice to be in front of you again. Thank you for uh, letting me speak. My name is Dan Turner. Um, I began to get alarmed about global warming probably before most of you were born in the 70s, when I started following climate science. Now the warnings of the scientists are being experienced by all of us, and no matter what we do, it's going to get worse before it gets better. The question is how much worse, and that's a matter of how quickly we can reduce greenhouse gas pollution. And the speed with which we can reduce greenhouse gases is a matter of how many resources we put toward the effort. I like the outdoors. I like to breathe. I suspect you do too. 
1850, the area that's now Glacier National Park had 150 active glaciers covering many square miles. By 1966, there were 37 named glaciers, which in total covered eight square miles. By 2015, just over five square miles. In 2022, there are only 25 active glaciers left, and the latest studies predict disappearance of most or all glaciers in less than six years. And this was done in 2022. Last year was the warmest year ever. The city's budgeting of $10 million for the first year of addressing greenhouse gas emissions is a good start, but we need to scale up by at least a factor of 10 and fast. We need to develop the workforce that can do the work, because, and because this takes time, we cannot afford to delay. With the Climate Legacy Initiative update, I see the city doing many of the smart things that need to happen. Good work. Push ahead, especially with a block-by-block -block approach to decarbonization that includes all residents. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Our next speaker is Patrice Kolsch from Ward 2. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Patrice Kelch, and I live in the Seward neighborhood. I'm deeply appreciative of the city's climate commitment and the aspiration that whether homeowner or renter, regardless of income or zip code, we should all have healthy and sustainable homes. My husband and I want to update the electrical system in our century-old house. The estimate runs from about $5,000 just to be able to run more than the refrigerator and one other appliance in the kitchen to $24,000 to be ready to transition to appliances that don't use fossil gas and to be able to charge electric vehicles. We've also been told that right now there's only $600 in upgrade rebates in Minnesota, even though the federal clean energy programs should provide more than $10,000 in upgrade rebates to households. The rebates are not yet available in Minnesota because the Minnesota Department is still working on it. While we wait for the state to make these federally appropriated funds available to Minnesotans, I'm also keenly aware that these rebates will only be available to homeowners and not to renters, which make up more than half the city's residents. We need a much more expansive and equitable approach to decarbonizing all our homes. Residents from all over Minneapolis support bold climate action. Please expand the Climate Legacy Initiative to more than 100 million annually and build programs and policies that protect and benefit renters as well as homeowners. And for the city of Minneapolis to reach these goals, we are going to need a strong partner at the state level Please keep pushing the state on behalf of the residents of our city. Thank you. Thank you, Patrice. Next up, Spencer Polk from Ward 9. Thank you, Kate Chaspin. Hello, council members. My name is Spencer. I am a renter in Ward 9, and I'm a leader with the Young Adult Coalition of Isaiah. I used to work for a fossil gas utility reviewing construction plans. I watched the continued replacement and expansion of the fossil gas network in Minneapolis for each, with each season, buried infrastructure meant to last for the next 50 to 100 years. This was not on par with the future I hoped for. In Minneapolis and elsewhere, we are seeing the symptoms of climate change already un undermine our public and social infrastructure, degrading community stability and health health and health, locally and globally. I have been playing pond hockey since I was four. This winter, I did not play outside once. For me, that is a deep and personal loss of community. We need a, a just transition of the systems of power continuing business as usual and to make investments in communities most impacted. 
We need a just transition that centers renters and workers of Minneapolis to build a more healthy city for everyone. Housing is our most foundational and critical public communal infrastructure we have, yet nearly all of it is privatized. In the next five years, I want to see me and my neighbors' homes in the south side green zone decarbonized and electrified. I want our energy use and bill to go down and for rent to stay affordable. One day I hope to communally own a home of my, our own. With this, we need public investments in deep collaboration with renters. We need to bring more and more homes into public and community ownership while building a stronger green workforce along the way. We can build and own it ourselves. Last year, I've observed city council members, staff, and residents from various parts of our city unite to champion bold climate action. I believe we can re replicate this unity once again. I urge you to expand the Climate Legacy Initiative to a budget of more than 100 million and to establish programs and policies that safeguard the interests of low-income workers and renters. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Spencer. Our next speaker is Adrian from Ward 9. Apologies for, for um, not being able to read your last name, so if you could speak that. It's fine, thank you. <laughs> Hello, Councilman Cashman and City Council members. Um, my name is Adrian Cox Thurmond. I'm here with the Young Adult Coalition of Isaiah as well. Um, I formulated this in the last 10 minutes, so bear with me. This meeting has been about the Climate Legacy Initiative for the most part, and we've had a lot of conversations around equity, which I am really enjoying hearing, and I don't want to sideline any efforts around block-by-block -block efforts, um, around new jobs, and around green zones. I want to center a conversation around housing justice as well, because I feel very strongly that housing justice is not separable from climate equity, um, that racial justice and zoning are not separable from climate equity and that the city's response to houselessness um, that I have witnessed as a resident of South Minneapolis has not resonated with me um, in the same way that a lot of these conversations around equity are, are being had. Um, I want to see more efforts made to connect um, conversations around houselessness and housing justice to efforts that are being made on the part of the city council and organizations um, separate to, yeah, to make sure that we are keeping in mind the people who aren't even housed um, in these efforts because there's huge opportunities for those people to be left behind in a lot of these conversations. Um, conversations around colonialism and uh, more global conversations around like refugees are also going to be so much more of a thing in the next coming years and I love where we're starting but I want to echo what has been said that these programs need incredible expansion. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for raising the intersections that are so important in this conversation and the many more Minnesotans that we continue to welcome here because of climate change and displacement from their home countries. Um, our next speaker is Emmer Griffin from Ward 8. Uh, thank you all for, for hearing me today. I, uh, my name is Emma Griffin. I'm a resident of the Bancroft neighborhood um, with my family. I cannot speak quite as articulately as some of the other folks here today, but I wanted to add my voice to everything that uh, we have all been advocating for today. Um, I want this city to be more healthy and more resilient for my children, their neighbors, their friends. Um, you know, as I drive around even just our local area, there are such wide disparities, even block by block, between what uh, resources are available and how people are able to, to live their lives. Um, I was very excited and uh, enjoyed hearing how much is already starting to happen and want to appreciate the work that everyone is doing because I understand how complicated it must be. Uh, but we have to continue to push this and we have to grow the funding to transition a greater number of homes um, so that everyone who needs it uh, can can access it. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. Um, next is Leah, Liam Norman from Ward 3. Hi, Council. Um, like many people have said before, uh, there's been fantastic points made, so I'll try and keep it quick and short. Um, I want to thank you all for the work you've put into the Climate Legacy Initiative already. Um, I looked at the slides from the recent presentation, and there are some really, really awesome ideas in there, including uh, the block-by-block -block rollout of home um, weatherization with cooperative energy futures. Um, climate change is an issue that requires ambitious problem solving, which I think we can see in those, in those ideas. Um, and these ambitious problem solving tactics require a lot of resources. Um, and we can commit all sorts of time and energy to these projects. And there are plenty of people doing that already. Um, but we also need a significant amount of money to uh, make sure these programs don't fall flat or don't take off at all. Um, while 10 million a year is a great start, um, in order to reach the goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 85% by 2035, we're going to need um, a, to drastically ramp up funding over the next few years. Um, again, I want to thank you for the work you've put into the Climate Legacy Initiative so far. I'm super excited <coughs> excuse me, to see the opportunity Minneapolis has to be a leader in um, climate justice, in uh, climate equity work in this country and even worldwide. Um, we have momentum here, so let's put the money where our mouths are. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. Next up is Steve Smith from Ward 9. Hi, I'm Steve Smith. I live um, a couple blocks south of Powderhorn and three blocks from George Floyd Square. And I'm very proud to be a part of that neighborhood. Um, the neighborhood was uh, a lot of people signed up in support uh, last summer to get this thing going in my neighborhood. Uh, we have a lot of community activism that it started with COVID uh, before the George Floyd Square thing. Um, but we've both many people in the neighborhood have really pulled together. Um, they're behind this. Um, I'm very thankful for all the young people uh, in our neighborhood who have done so much to, uh, if you've seen all the boulevards around uh, our neighborhood on the uh, east side of Chicago there, um, and they've done painting garages. Um, I'm very proud of my neighborhood, and I really think about these young people, um, and I hope that many of them can go into work uh, doing the work uh, that are, that's ways ahead of us. Um, I personally have serious respiratory problems, and uh, so this summer, last summer was a very bad problem for me. Um, I know what it's like not to be able to breathe, um, and uh, I went through a scare a month ago when uh, it looked like I wasn't going to, uh, I was losing my coverage for my respiratory medication, and uh, which costs a lot anyway, but would have cost a lot more. My doctor's office got it straightened out, but it was very scary. It only took two weeks, two or three weeks but it's very scary to think about going without medication. And uh, we have to clean up our air. Um, air causes all, uh, polluted air causes uh, a lot of problems, uh, including dementia. And I'm, I just turned 76, and so I think about that. Um, uh, thank you very much for your time, and thanks for everything you've been doing. Appreciate that, Steve. Um, next is Jubilee Prosser from Ward 1. Hello everyone, my name is Jubilee Prosser and I'm a leader with the Young Adult Coalition of Isaiah. Um, today I'm speaking here as a young person and as a resident of Minneapolis. Everyone deserves to benefit from the clean energy transition, no matter how much money we, ma we make or what our background is, or whether we are a renter or a homeowner. Right now, many federal clean energy programs will provide more than 10,000 to households, which is really cool and really incredible. Um, however, most of that money, as some people said before, most of that money is only available to homeowners, and more than half of Minneapolis residents are renters and won't qualify for that money. I am a renter, and I also want safe indoor air. 
I also want to live in a building that has the lowest energy burden it can possibly have. I also want to have affordable and low utility fees. Um, and I also want to slow climate change. And right now, I do not have the power to make these changes in the spaces that I'm renting. The past few years have shown how the residents of Minneapolis and the City Council have come together for bold climate action. Let's keep that momentum and expand the Climate Legacy Initiative to more than $100 million. I ask the City Council and Council Member, Min Council Member Cashman to build programs and policies that protect renters and include renters in the fight against climate change. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Jubilee. Next is Julie Doherty from Ward 12. Hi, thank you. I am Julie Doherty and I am from Ward 12. Um, I'm gonna echo what everyone else has said. Thank you so very much, uh, Chair Cashman and members of the committee for all that you've done so far. Um, I'm gonna focus, there's so much to talk about when we talk about climate change, but I'm gonna focus on the area that has been touched on by a few people, and that is people near and dear to my heart, renters. We all know, looking at the uh, uh, climate equity plans, that um, dramatically reducing greenhouse gas uh, emissions from houses and other residential areas is really critical to tackling the climate challenge but rental housing provides a particular challenge. Um, typically, these rental homes are less energy efficient than others, on average consuming 15% more energy per square foot than owner-occupied homes. Obviously, renters can't retrofit their houses, uh, their units, um, and they need help from you to do that. You know, the problem with renters is they don't have a lobby. They don't have a strong lobby. So what I am asking each of you to do is be their lobbyists, work for them, and take a special place to help renters in Minneapolis climate change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. You know, as a renter myself, I experienced that frustration that I can't do anything about the energy systems in my home especially when my landlord is a capital assets company out of California and I've never met them. So, you know, with that in mind, it's really important that we bring our property owners to the table in this conversation and we, we can help with that. Um, next up is Shane Hilton from Ward 11. Hello, everyone. This is real quick, right to the point. Um, good afternoon, Chair. Cashman and members of the committee. My name is Shane Hilton. I'm a leader with Onidos, Minnesota and a member of Ward 11. I'm grateful for your support to get the climate equity plan passed last year and I'm excited to continue supporting the funding of this work until its benefits reach everyone, definitely reach everyone, including this, you know, in the big in the city, including big apartment complexes like the one I live in. And this, we really, really need this. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Shane. Next is Robert Reed, also from Ward 11. Good afternoon, esteemed council members. Um, I hope you're enjoying this beautiful snowy cold weather. Isn't it delightful? <laughs> it's a reminder of what a true Minnesota winter should look like. However, it's hard to imagine that this year's unusually warm weather was a stark reminder of the climate changes occurring around us. While $10 million sounds a lot and we're so appreciative of it, it only really scratches the surface of what's needed to address the multifaceted challenges that are facing us. With $100 million over the next maybe five years or less, however, the scope of possibilities expands exponentially. This funding could catalyze large scale change. Imagine the number of green jobs that could be created, the communities that could be transformed, and the lives that could positively be impacted by such a significant investment. In my work, teaching stress reduction at the University of Minnesota, 
we have noted that climate anxiety is a significant and growing mental health concern among people of all ages. A hundred million dollar investment sends a powerful message of hope and determination. It shows that we are serious about combating climate change and that we're willing to invest resources commensurate to the scale of change, <coughs> to the scale of the challenge. This in turn can help alleviate some of the mental health burdens associated with climate anxiety by providing tangible evidence that action is being taken. To truly make an impact, we must have the foresight to substantially increase funding. I urge the council to prioritize allocating at least $100 million over the next few years. This investment will affirm, affirm our commitment to both addressing the climate crisis and promoting equity. So let's seize this moment to secure a better future for generations to come. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Robert. Next is Marcus Mills from Ward 3. Thank you, Chair Cashman and committee members. Um, as an activist working on some of these issues and as someone who grew up, grew up struggling with asthma, thanks for all this work. It's really helpful and it's something that uh, is very much appreciated. Um, thanks to the Climate Legacy Initiative and the Climate and Equity Plan and the work plans that have gone forward today. Um, we need to implement block by block energy efficiency retrofitting as is been mentioned several times, and uh, beneficial electrification, as well as to push utilities to promote uh, many other options, like point-of-sale uh, so point rebates for high-efficiency and off-peak optimized appliances, building up capacity for our just transition by dedicating these funds and scaling up to beyond $100 million annually for this work uh, well before the end of the decade. Let's make sure that we demand more participation and cooperation of our clean energy partners, our utilities. As a longtime renter, I need to say, we need to do better ensuring that renters have options to take part in the energy future we're creating. We need to study and implement district geothermal, and we should be assisting those who are moving forward with it as we speak. They can help us gather the data on how to maximize the potential of these solutions. We also need to revisit inclusive financing with our Public Utilities Commission. I look forward to meeting and working with each of you and our sustainability department to make these dreams a reality. And I thank you for the work that you've put in so far. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcus. Uh, I'll ask the clerk if there's anyone else who signed up to speak today. Madam Chair, there's just one more. Samantha Diaz. Sam Diaz. Madam Chair, Council Members, my name is Samantha Diaz. I am the Political Director for SEIU Local 26. We represent 8,000 uh, janitors, security officers, high-rise window washers here um, in the Twin Cities, primarily in Minneapolis. We have, we represent largely black, brown immigrant workers, low-wage workers, um, many of whom are renters uh, in the city of Minneapolis. And so uh, on behalf of our 8,000 members, uh, thank you. Uh, for the work that you've committed, the investments that you've made uh, with the Climate uh, Legacy Initiative, and we're asking to do more. Um, our members and uh, our, our employers have sacrificed uh, in, our, in our piece of this, uh, investing in green training programs so that the chemicals uh, that our, our, jan our janitorials, commercial and retail janitor uh, janitors use uh, are safe and don't uh, perpetuate the inequities that our members continue uh, to endure as uh, folks that have endured the worst of the climate injustices. Um, I think about a member, uh, Samara, who uh, is a leader, a leader member in our union, uh, actually had to leave the city of Minneapolis because of asthma. Um, uh, rented in North Minneapolis, the did not get, did not live in the environment in a in a, in an apartment that was conducive uh, to to her asthma. Um, living in the metro, uh, I mean, excuse me, living in the suburbs now, her asthma has um, the instances of like asthma attacks has subsided, and so this is incredibly urgent for our members, um, and so. 
thank you for the work, but we know that there's an incredible amount of work and investment uh, that, that, needs to, that needs to happen moving forward. So, so thank you. Excellent. Well, thanks everyone for being here today. I just want to say how pleased it makes me that you all showed up to speak about this issue, especially after the warmest winter on record, which has been very difficult <laughs> um, to grapple with. Um, and just to reaffirm that we're here because of you, we're here for you, we're here to work together with you. This committee is very uh, committed to transparency and accountability with the work that we do, and so the, this is just the beginning of a conversation moving forward this year. Um, with that, I'll see if any colleagues have comments. Councilmember Osmond. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, community members, for being here and continue to educate us. Um, you are committed to this work, and uh, we couldn't do or make policies that are great for our community. Um, I met some of you privately, and you have been a great educating me and letting me know that you know the climate crisis is not just the local it's global what do we do here can affect many lives in the world um, we see in dry outs famine some countries in the world but somehow we're connected what we do here is connected locally i want to thank you and organizations like unidos and uh, azea and and all of you showing up i also want to thank the staff for really putting the commitment and the work for this i welcome the block by Black Pilot Program, and also I want to someone who represents a large renters and um, very uh, complex apartments and dense dense neighborhood. We need to kind of approach them in a in different way. Um, renters uh, have to have a voice, and what can help them is uh, education, awareness. Um, this is not something you see every day on TV. Uh, you know. Community get educated by hearing over and over and over, but uh, the climate education and knowing the crisis and the challenges that we're facing, not every person in our community knows that. So we gotta figure out a way to educate those renters and um, figure out for community, how can they engage, especially if they live in, in a very dense neighborhood like Stephen Square and, and others. So again, thank you so much and we will continue uh, to be committed to uh, the work you're doing. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Osman. Um, you know, Ward 6 and Ward 7 both have a large downtown population with high rises that are uh, residents who live on mainly district energy systems, and that's another complexity to this that we have to grapple with. So with that, I'll um, invite Vice Chair Koski. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to echo Councilmember Osman's statements. Um, I don't think we could could say it any better than he just did. Um, but I just want to also thank our city staff um, as well who have been working so diligently and partnering. Uh, and I think that's probably one of the most um, wonderful things that I've seen with this is their partnership with us uh, as colleagues up here, but also with all of you as well. I know that they have been in deep conversations every step of the way. And so I'm just um, grateful for all of you willing to come together and collaborate in that way. And I think it, this is a great example to see when we work together how we can um, continue to make progress. And many of you stated that this is just the beginning. And I think that we all feel that way. And we know we have big goals and ambitions and um, we are ready to tackle those. Um, but uh, we're grateful that we can start here. Uh, and I just want to also just uh, specifically thank uh, Robert, Marie, and Shane from Ward 11 that showed up today and really appreciate them coming. So thank you so much. Thank you, Vice Chair Koski. Uh, Councilmember Chavez. <laughs> Sorry, I just <laughs> forgot to put my thing down, but now that you called me, I also wanted to thank my residents that came out and uh, gave some public comment addressing this uh, climate crisis is important and it starts at the local level. So I'm thankful for our staff for helping address this and mm -hmm. appreciate the comments and feedback. Uh, as we continue to ramp up uh, our investments in this in this initiative. Thank you. Excellent. Councilmember Chowdhury. Good work, Councilmember Chavez. <laughs> that was really good impromptu. <laughs> um, thank you, Chair uh, Cashman. Really appreciate it. I, I just have to say I think your public testimony 100% warrants a response from us. And I just want to say that hearing from you was really wonderful and this is the best part of this job is just 
hearing the stories of residents across our city and I really appreciated the way that many of you laid out the intersections of addressing climate change and the importance of equity and the fact that it's beyond just a word. It's related to housing justice. It's related to a multi-generational effort and the way that it impacts our aging population, the way that our young people are impacted. Um, I remember when I was, I think, about eight years old, uh, where I had a coherent understanding of climate change. And I will be dating myself in a, in a different way than people say, but it was when I watched The Inconvenient Truth, mm -hmm. and I just remember being filled with anxiety um, as a young child and thinking, what, what could I do um, differently, or how can I sp spread the word about how we can uh, address, address systems? And I think I appreciated the way that many people spoke about young people and their efforts um, in the climate movement and how they're important to center because I think our young people, including myself, have lived our whole lives with a acute level of climate anxiety and um, an acute level of fear of the future, of thinking about are we going to be able to have a family here, are we going to be able to have a home, and I also appreciated the acknowledgement of our immigrant communities. I come from uh, a Bengali uh, family and Bangladesh is um, one of I think it's like top 10 countries impacted by climate change and uh, is looking at a future where climate refugees from um, uh, a country where I still have a lot of families is likely and so I just appreciate your efforts and thank you to the Ward 12 residents that submitted responses and thank you to Julie who came up and Lee um, I want to connect more with Ward 12 residents and how we can connect with the renters in our community and just engage more deeply about bringing people together on what we can do in our part of Minneapolis. Well said, as always, Councilmember Chowdhury. And um, before we close up today, I just want to thank everyone for using us gratitude and a, a moment of celebration for the work that we've achieved. Um, so while we're not supposed to applaud in this room, I think some, <laughs> some air applause are warranted. So celebrating our achievements along the way keeps us very motivated and keeps us united. So thanks for being here today. And without any further comment, we will adjourn the meeting. Thank you so much. Madam Chair, there's one more item on the agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Which one is that? I know. Did I leave it out of the script? No. Stay if you want to hear about winter walking and biking <laughs> study. Okay. Should've just left. Should've. Next we have item number nine, a public comment period related to the, sorry, I'm on the wrong item here. Number 10, winter walking and biking study update. So I'll ask Director Brett Jelly to introduce this item. Thank you, Chair Cashman. Uh, Ethan Fawley, our Vision Zero program coordinator will give an overview of this item. Gotta push the button, yeah, that, that helps. Um, so uh, my name is Ethan Foley. I'm the Vision Zero Program Coordinator based in uh, Public Works, and I am talking about the winter walking and biking study today, which obviously relates some to our last topic, as uh, most things we do uh, um, do. So today I'm gonna give you a little context for this report and then talk about, there's been a lot of recent work on this. I'm gonna kind of give a little summary of that and how this relates to that uh, recent work on uh, sidewalk winter maintenance in particular and I'll talk about some of the status of um, the the pilots that were funded in 2024 and then we'll talk about where we're going with the study and what we're recommending um, uh, as part of this uh, first I want to acknowledge I focus on traffic safety um, I was not the lead on this study but I am presenting today but I so I want to acknowledge the other folks that were uh, really involved in getting this inclu including our previous uh, pedestrian bicycle co coordinator cadence Novak um, so this particular study uh, builds on a lot of other studies, including a lot that happened last year. And so this really consolidates all the previous work and provides a status update on those things, as well as recommending actions that we can do to build on that to improve winter walking and biking in uh, years to come. 
just to provide a little context, I know this is something the committee is engaged on a lot. Last year, and you know, there's a number of new members to the committee um, as well. Um, so just a little context on how we think about, you know, our challenges, and this in particular related to sidewalk clearing. Um, so this has a lot going on in it, but I'll acknowledge, uh, first of all, the pink line is the total seasonal snowfall, um, which again, related to the last conversation, we see this goes up and down, and we'll see that even more in the future with climate change. Um, and you can see how that sort of relates over time a little bit to some of the complaints we receive um, related to snow and ice on sidewalks. And then ultimately from those, we work to create cases, authorize cleanups, and then go and make cleanups. And so this is a process we do currently to manage um, uh, challenges related to sidewalk clearing in the winter time. Um, and a lot of things we're doing is how do we make this work better, right? And how do we make our um, sidewalks, our bikeways accessible throughout the winter. It's a really important thing for our, our goals as a city. So we've been working on this for a lot over the last um, really 10 years and more. A um, couple things we'll highlight is this study is really an update of, a, in, a, in a way of a 2018 study that we did initially looking at some options for improved pedestrian and bicycle winter maintenance. Um, out of that, we ended up putting forward some actions that we've been working on in a supplemental report. Um, that included things like we now go out and do proactive uh, sidewalk uh, assessments staff do at Public Works um, to get a sense of um, where are their challenges and help clearing uh, reports so we can clear sidewalks and also to give us a baseline of how, how are we doing citywide in, in clearing. Um, we also built on that with the Transportation Action Plan, which has um, strategies that relate to, to winter walking and biking and actions related to those. In 2020, there was also extended, expanded funding for uh, sidewalk corner clearing, um, which, I'll, uh, which I'll talk about more in a second. Um, and then in 2022 and 2023, we had a lot of conversation with the council around very, various aspects focused on the sidewalk snow and ice uh, challenges in particular. And so last year, uh, the council uh, passed a legislative directive around evaluating um, sidewalk, uh, the potential of citywide, um, city done sidewalk snow and ice clearing. And we reported back on that last, um, last June. I'm not gonna go into all the details of that report here because we talked about that quite a bit last year. Um, and then we also coming out of that um, reported on um, ideas for sidewalk pilots, and those were eventually funded um, uh, in, the, in the budget. Thank you for that, and so I'll talk about that in just a minute on where those are at. Um, and we also uh, did some other changes last winter, which I'll talk about in a second here. So, so lots of work here, and I think, as you can see, a lot in particular on the sidewalk side. So one of the changes we implemented this last winter is um, adjusting contractor fees to, to accurate, more accurately reflect snow removal costs. And so, it, this is a map of um, repeat uh, complaints by property. And one of the things we see is that um, there are some regular repeat, uh, especially larger properties that we have challenges. And um, the reality, just to be honest, is that our, our fee structure um, sometimes supported that um, happening. And we've changed that so that um, it's fairer for all property types and the length of sidewalk and other things um, more accurately reflects the costs of having a contractor go out and clear the sidewalk if a property owner doesn't do that. So this is something we implemented for this past winter. Now, we are evaluating that, but we also you know, had an abnormal winter and won't have quite as much data um, uh, for initial evaluation of this, but there will be more to come on this. So this is something we continue to look at and way, uh, example of ways we can continue to improve our processes in this area. Um, so as you likely know, the, the 2024 approved budget does include almost $600,000 ongoing for four uh, pilots related to sidewalk snow and ice clearing. Um, and you can see them here, the snow ambassador pilot, snow caseworker pilot, mobile team pilot, and senior snow clearing assistance pilot. Um, for the public, these are all, you know, all together gonna be different ways, 
systems we're trying out, so how are we getting at um, understanding what are the barriers for individual property owners in some cases for being able to clear their sidewalks? How are we supporting the, uh, them proactively and being able, um, providing resources where needed? Um, and how are we getting out there even more proactively to address challenges that we're seeing on our street? And then, of course, reporting back on lessons learned and other things, because these are pilots. Um, so we are in the process of setting up for implementing these pilots. We are uh, currently uh, uh, working to, uh, we're about to, to start the process for, for hiring um, positions um, related to the pilots and really setting up so that we can launch the full pilots in uh, this coming for this coming winter and and then uh, so that that's there's a lot more that will come here and we will be reporting back uh, on more details to come but uh, we really look forward to implementing these pilots for the coming winter okay um, now switching gears a little bit to the study and like what do we look at so this this graph what I want you to know here is okay this is Status of previous winter walking options and actions. You can see we've looked at a lot of different things over the last uh, six years in the area of winter walking. Um, and I will highlight here that complete or complete and ongoing or in progress, most of these things we're working on actively. Um, and, and so I think that's reflecting a lot of the conversations and other things that we've, we've had um, last year and, and, and years before. So a lot of work in this area. Um, if you look at, I'm not gonna go through all these details, but um, for our transportation action plan actions in this area, you can see again, a lot of activity. Um, a th couple things here I'm gonna just pull out is, we did, um, one of the actions here is uh, ev evaluate the feasibility of adjusting a or, uh, city ordinance to require earlier clearing. So this is something we did evaluate with this study, and we're not recommending a change in city ordinance um, related to clearing schedule, partly because the current um, ordinance, which requires all properties to clear within 24 hours of the end of the snow, and uh, commercial properties um, to clear within four daylight hours, um, we don't think it's practical to sp speed that up citywide given people's realities for uh, all the property owners across the city. So um, just wanted to note that one in um, particular, something we looked at with this study. And then uh, a lot of other areas, very important topics. And then, you know, in progress here, or uh, completed ongoing is, you know, the pilot piece is like, there's a lot of progress happening there and that's really important in this area and that's gonna be continuing. So. Looking forward with this particular study, we are recommending um, some new actions for winter walking, and these are intended for uh, future inclusion in a transportation action plan update. Uh, and they're gonna build on those actions I just uh, showed on the previous slide. So these um, new actions focus around the winter sidewalk pilots. Uh, we wanted to recognize more clearly the, the work we are doing around corner clearing, which is a very important part of sidewalk snow and ice clearing. And so here are, you know, the standards here are we're within three days after, uh, you know, uh, typically a, a snow emergency or other large snowfall, we are clearing all corners of the pedestrian prior priority network. And then within nine days, we're getting to all corners in the city. Um, and so that's uh, with the funding that we've gotten over um, a few years, uh, that's where we're at, and we think that's a, a, a really good place citywide and a uh, very important part of this program. One thing in looking forward to the future is uh, we're going to be installing, actually in our Vision Zero program, um, a lot more pedestrian safety island and other intersection medians to um, help to support traffic safety. And so this is an area where we know that there um, will we will have some additional winter maintenance needs and we wanna make sure we're able to uh, service those needs. Um, uh, so that's one thing we're identifying as a, as a need in this plan. And then we also um, recognize that there's some uh, information gap sometimes around responsibilities for bus stop clearing um, if for property owners. And so that's an area where we feel like we can do a little more uh, awareness um, building in the future. Okay, switching gears, so that's a lot on sidewalk clearing, which is a really important topic. 
uh, to winter biking pieces here. So um, I think my summary here of this, this pie chart is um, we have looked at and have been doing a little less on the winter biking side um, in, in recent years. But actually one of the things I think is really important um, is uh, we did right before this period um, and relates to protected bikeway winter maintenance. So we have been doing work in this area and we have really important ongoing work, but a little less action recently than on the sidewalk side. So if you look at our transportation action plan, winter biking actions, um, I mentioned uh, clearing of protected bike lanes and trails. So we do clear protected bike lanes and trails within 24 hours. Um, and we, we have resources to do that, um, which as we add new protected bike lanes, um, we're able to have the resources to be able to clear them and maintain them in the winter, which is tremendous. Um, a part of our all ages and ability bikeway network is those protected bikeways and trails, but we also have like neighborhood greenways, which are often like bike boulevards as part of that. And so that's an area where we, we know that there's um, more need for uh, thinking related to uh, winter biking maintenance. So that's a, gonna be a, a, still a work in progress and we'll reflect that a little more in our actions recommended through this study. Um, so we're <coughs> our recommended actions for winter biking, uh, again, building off of our existing actions in this area and we really wanna be able to, uh, with the neighborhood greenway side, the bike boulevard side, implement a pilot of improved winter maintenance there. And this is something that's probably still a, a couple years out that we would try this, but we need to test some different methods on how we would best do that before we can jump into making sure we're maintaining those really well in the winter time. Um, so that'll be coming. And then uh, a few other kind of education, um, public availability, information kind of uh, actions we're recommending as well. And then an important one related to continuing, one of the things we're doing is improving our bikeway designs to make sure that we can maintain them well in the winter time. So this is uh, an important part of our constant improvements on best practices. And then, hey, we'll get to bike racks. We know that being able to port, uh, park your bike is important too, and that's something we'll evaluate in the future as well. All right, so that's quite a bit of information. I wanna let you know that we're gonna be doing an online um, community open house on April 11th, and this will be a chance not just to talk about the study that I went over today, but to talk about the work in the, uh, that happened last year in the reports of city council around uh, the potential you know, evaluation of city-led snow and ice uh, clearing on sidewalks, um, the pilots and other things, just to make sure that community knows all the conversation and, um, and the information uh, that has happened over the last year plus in this area. Uh, there's obviously a lot of implementation work happening in this area um, and that will be continuing. We, we're starting, you know, we're continuing on many of these actions and starting on the one, new ones that we identified through this study. And then we will be coming back um, at some point in the future to incorporate recommended actions into a future transportation action plan update. And probably the next big thing council should expect in this area is some sort of uh, annual report on our winter sidewalk pilots coming up um, this winter. So, uh, and with that, I'll thank you and happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate all the work and, and for the update here. I do have a question. Uh, what would the, kind of the FTEs that you're planning to hire? A snow ambassador I saw, which sounds like a really fun job. Uh, what would they do in the summer? Like what would their job be like? Yeah, um, Chair Cashman, members of the committee, great question. So we're, we're working on those details in our team. Um, my understanding is that we are gonna be connecting it to other aspects of sidewalk maintenance and inspection and making sure we have a, a really good system for sidewalks year round and so contributing to that work. So it would be a year round position? Will Chair be. Cashman, committee members, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other questions from council members? Council member Osman. Thank you, Chair. I thank you for that presentation. I continue to highlight some of the challenges, especially in my ward, where city only relies on based on complaints, and um, 311 is not very popular in Ward 6. It's the least used number in, in, in any ward. And um, that means there's so many left um, behind sidewalks that are not getting attention uh, because residents are not reporting. And, 
you know, there's, of course, a lot of barriers with uh, uh, what 301 is, uh, language barrier, different challenges on that, and people not having time to really um, even report. And huge um, private or landlords that are have the sidewalks continue to um, not clear the sidewalks because um, they're not getting the complaint residents are supposed to do. So I just want to highlight that and also say, you know, that is one challenge we're seeing um, and letting you know that uh, only relying on uh, complaints by from the residents to clear the sidewalks. Uh, it's a very challenging for some neighborhoods. And is there any plan or uh, for the staff to really focus on some of these areas that are not getting um, complaints. I haven't seen, I'd love to see the charts of uh, complaints by ward. Um, that would be helpful. But um, is there any, 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 any plan for, for the public works staff to kind of really look into this and that, well, we, we might have some issue here. Uh, Chair Cashman, members of the committee, um, that it's a, you can look at this map on the screen and you can see that some of this is where are th there are challenges and some of this is probably where are people reporting more, right? And uh, and so we are definitely aware of that and that's wh why we started the program of proactive sidewalk inspections by city staff uh, in uh, the winter of 2016, or 2018, sorry. And so since then, we go out and we are proactively covering different sections of the city and so um, uh, we are definitely getting to all the wards with that, and, um, and that is building our database of understanding across the city and not uh, independent of and in addition to 311 complaints. And so that information has been really important for us in developing the proposal for the uh, sidewalk clearing pilots, um, which also will add additional data with a focus on recognizing some of those, uh, the challenges we see in kind of disparate re reporting as well as part of that, those pilots. And so um, I think you asked for particularly a chart by ward of complaints. And we actually, I do believe we have a graph on that. And so um, I'll make sure to follow up with your office um, with, with that information. Thank you so much. Yeah, you will. It's very helpful to hear that the staff goes there and um, you know, survey the areas that are that are having some challenges. Uh, places that are getting more complaints does not mean that they have the most issues. <laughs> and I think it's also, um, especially in my ward, and I highlight this, not just the, of course, the, the snow issue, but the lighting issue and so many different challenges. Uh, we have dark neighborhoods in, in, my, in, my neighbor, in, in my ward that are have been having challenges because people are not reporting and they don't have the, you know, uh, the knowledge or even the how there's so many barriers for them to report that. And I continue to uh, raise that point that we have to find different way of uh, providing services to all residents. Um, but thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, Council Member Kosky, do you want to add something here? Nope. All right. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'll ask the clerk to file that report. And with that, we have concluded all business to come before the committee. So without objection, we stand adjourned. Thank you.